All right, let's turn our Bibles tonight, first of all, to Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. And I'll read one verse of Scripture tonight for our text. And then after uh, I have a word of prayer, uh, we're going to uh, read in Genesis chapter number 48. And so uh, if you want to find both of those places in your Bible, first uh, Hebrews chapter number 11, uh, and then we'll look in Genesis chapter number 48. We're going to look uh, once again at the subject of faith. And uh, I know that we spent uh, back in 2018, but some of you have already forgotten uh, that far back, 2018. We spent a year in Sunday school on faith, and uh, we're revisiting this subject. Uh, but I don't think we can talk about faith too much uh, when it is the instrument that we please God. Uh, it is impossible without faith to please God. And so to live by faith uh, is, is, is what God has for us, but it's a way for us to please Him. And so uh, we're going to look once again uh, at this uh, subject of faith, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the uh, Bible study tonight. Um, I was speaking with one of our members earlier, Brother Tony Warden, I was doing some work at my house, and, um, uh, and he said, I hope you got a good one tonight. Remember that true story? Yes, true story. He's forgotten already. And I said, I, I said, well, I said, I don't know if I got to go, and it's Bible, so it's good. And uh, I said, now I'm gonna I'm gonna teach about old people tonight. And he's like, oh, good. So I got to thinking about that. I, I, I guess I need to get this in about ten minutes, or or my target audience is gonna fall asleep on me. And so, uh, so we'll uh, we'll see we'll see how that goes this evening. But uh, some truths that I want us to hold on to: Hebrews chapter eleven. Verse number 21, uh, it's good to have in the service James. I met James earlier in the service, and uh, he's sitting down here with Brother Stanley, our Brother Sally. Uh, so you come by and, and meet James so he meets a nice church member uh, while he's here. And I believe he got a newspaper on the, at his house, and, that, and uh, that's how he learned about us. So uh, thank you for being in the service tonight. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 11, verse 21, By faith Jacob... Uh, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. You and I know that uh, this is the great chapter of faith, the hall of faith as it is often referred to. Uh, each of these characters we've studied, we've been in and out of Hebrews 11 through the years, and uh, what, what an what a example of faith they all are to us. Some are obvious they're in there, and they're obvious that they're in there. Uh, some would not be so obvious, and we've studied and learned why God placed them in there. Um, but we find Jacob. Uh, Jacob is a well-known Bible character in the Old Testament. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Uh, Jacob, uh, of course, we know God changed his name to Israel, and God use that name to name his people. There's so much in, in that in itself. Uh, but Jacob, when you think about all we know of Jacob, there's not a lot of good that we know of Jacob. Jacob deceived his father and stole the birthright. Um, Jacob was a deceiver, a conniver. He was a trickster. Uh, we know that he wrestled with God he, I mean, he did some good things, uh, but, but you come to the end of Jacob's life, and then now we look, knowing what we know of Jacob, we see what God says about Jacob's faith. He tells us in the book of Genesis a lot about Jacob. Hebrews chapter 11 refers to these, these individuals and their faith. Notice again verse 21. By faith Jacob, when he was a dying... When he was an old man is when God mentions that period of his life, mentions his faith. Uh, we're going to go into, and you, we've seen several times, you, Joseph's mentioned here, and we know Joseph as a, that young boy, and we know things about him, we know things about David. But Jacob, what God specifically mentions about Jacob is when he was, at, he was almost ready to die. That's when he took note of his faith. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying Bless both the sons of Joseph and worship, leaning upon the top of his staff. Uh, after we pray, we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 48, and we're going to read the account of that story uh, that is mentioned 
in Hebrews chapter 11, but I want you to think about it just for a moment. All we know of Jacob, much that we would not want to pattern after, a deceiver, conniver, there really isn't anything greatly significant, spiritually speaking. I mean, there's, there's, there's things, but you think about what we know of him. But when he comes to the end of his life, God takes note of his faith and preserves it in Scripture for eternity. At the end of his life, I take note of his faith and then tells the story that's wrapped around that faith. Tonight, I'm going to teach on it's never too late for faith. It's never too late for faith. Father, I pray that you'll help us tonight as we uh, look at this subject, and I pray that you'll guide my thoughts tonight. There's there's so much uh, to get to in a short amount of time. Uh, Father, I pray that you'll just be with your people. May tonight, may we uh, grab hold of the truths that we'll see. May they encourage us to stay faithful. Uh, May they encourage us to pray for others. Uh, Father, I pray that you'll just use the Bible study tonight for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 48, if you have your Bible uh, turned there, uh, and we'll read this story that is mentioned in Hebrews chapter number 11. And it came to pass, after, verse number 1, after these things, that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. Let me stop right there. I want to mention something that I'm reminded of in verse number four. God decides who God blesses. Uh, When God met with Jacob and blessed him, you have to search real hard in Scripture to find something likable about Jacob. Uh, he had deceived his father. He had stole the birthright from his brother. But God decides who God blesses. And I just want to say I'm thankful that man does not decide who God blesses. That's just extra tonight. Verse number 5. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt... Before I came unto thee into Egypt are mine, as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. And thy issue which thou begettest after them shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. And as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath, and I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, and the same is Bethlehem. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons, and said, Who are, who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons, whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto thee, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face. And lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in the left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. The angel which redeemeth me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Interesting story in Scripture. It's very important. But what we've already said about Jacob and what we know about Jacob is Jacob, in his early years, was not a man of faith. We know the stories surrounding him deceiving his father Isaac, getting the birthright. God promised Abraham that he would make him a great nation. 
That promise was passed from Abraham to Isaac. When, when Isaac blessed Jacob, that promise was passed down to Jacob because uh, God keeps his word. And so uh, Jacob was that deceiver. Jacob was the one who had tricked his father. Jacob uh, was is an interesting Bible character and one that we really can relate to in, in a lot of different ways. But something that's important, we find him at the end of his life, a man of faith, because God uh, refers to him as such in Hebrews chapter number 11. Stay with me uh, for, the, for the introduction, and then I'll just mention the points to you uh, because that's probably how much time that we'll have. Uh, God, God kept his word in blessing <coughs> Excuse me, Jacob. Jacob comes to the end of his life in Hebrews chapter 11 where we read, he says he's getting ready to die, and that's when God took note of his faith. Uh, a lot of in Bible characters show great faith when they were younger. Jacob comes to the end of his life, and Jacob, uh, take, take Joseph. Joseph, as, as a young man, had to have faith in God. And from a young man, over and over, that faith was tested, that faith was tried. And he had to have faith. Jacob should have had faith as a younger man, but he manipulated things. He, did, he was not that, that, that kind of an individual. But now, at the end of his life, God said he was a man of faith. Why did he say he was a man of faith? Did he say he was a man of faith because uh, now he was reunited with Joseph? No. Did he say he was a man of faith because he, he deceived his father when he was a younger man? No. He said he was a man of faith because of when he came to the end of his life, he, he was worshiping the Lord, but he passed on the blessing to Ephraim and Manasseh. Sounds nice on the surface. Well, sure, Abraham, God promised the blessing. So now that, pass, that blessing prom, passes from Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob, and it's just going to continue. There's more to it than that, and we see it in our text. We'll get to it more in just a moment, but let me say this. Um, when he got to this point in his life, uh, God, God had blessed him, and we read how God said he blessed him. Now, God saw something in his heart that you and I cannot see. God saw something inside of him where he still was going to bless him. And as we look in our story tonight, I want to uh, want us to want to illustrate and want us to see how important this is. Joseph, we know the Bible character Joseph. We know what a great uh, man Joseph was. We know how uh, he was sold into slavery. We know how he was falsely accused and thrown into prison. And God elevated him to second uh, in command of that great nation. And it was to preserve his people. We know the faith in the, in the, in the purity of the man Joseph and how God blessed Joseph. Uh, it's interesting that it, we come to the end of Jacob's life and we're going to see his faith. What takes place is, and in, in it's in 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 a very rich verse, in verse number 10, uh, when J Joseph brings his children to him, he, and Israel said unto Joseph, I had not to see thy face. He thought Joseph was dead. You recall the story? I thought I was never going to see you again. And lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. Well, what a, what a testimony, what a praise what a thankful heart Jacob had. I never thought I'd see you again, and now I see your children. Uh, what a blessing that had to be. It's interesting because now he's going to pass his, the blessing on to Joseph's children. If you do anything about the 12 tribes of Israel, there is not a tribe of Joseph. Uh, the, the, there's a tribe of Ephraim and a tribe of Manasseh, and that's Joseph's two sons. So even though Joseph endured all that he endured, he got a double blessing because God passed it through his two sons. But we see them coming to uh, Jacob. Now picture uh, this with me, if you will. Let me, let me guess. All the kids are out, aren't they? I need some really short team. Lucas, come on. <laughs> Carson, let me, let, me, let me have you too. Yeah, when I said short, he said this. This he said this is his, oppor this is his opportunity, brother Farber. I'll let you be the old man to illustrate this. You sit right there. Sit right there. I don't want you to strain yourself. Come over here. Over here. I I, I picked the blonde. Wit wit wit. Okay, so Joseph is in the presence of Jacob, who is is close to death. Um, Jacob 
is meeting his grandchildren for the first time. Manasseh and Ephraim. And so what, uh, J- what Joseph does, the Bible says that he brings Manasseh with his left hand to the right hand of Jacob so that Jacob can place his right hand, which was the symbol of the greatest blessing, on the oldest, and his left hand on Ephraim. But that's not what Jacob did. Jacob reached across, and he laid his right hand on Ephraim, and then he put his left hand on Manasseh. You say, why is that important? It's important because God... As the scripture said, Jacob said, God has met with me, God blessed me, and we're going to find that Joseph got upset. But he, trusting God, went against tradition, went against what had always been, and instead of giving Manasseh, the oldest, the greatest blessing, you can can think of Joseph. Joseph was jerked away from his family and his father. You read the story of Joseph consecutively and how he's, he's sold into slavery. And every once in a while, you find the scripture telling us of his thoughts of his father. When his brothers come back to him and they don't recognize him, he, he, he questions them about his father. It, his heart was, is, is my father alive? And when they, they discover, Joseph discovers himself to them, he makes way with Pharaoh so that his father could come to him. Could you imagine this son who had been taken away, the favorite of his father, who now is in his presence in his last days. Can you think of what a moment this was to him when he brings his two boys to see granddad? Sees his two boys and he's, how, look how God has taken care of me. Look, 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 look here's, your, here's your grandson's. Here's my sons. What a proud moment this was. Manasseh and Ephraim are going to get a blessing. Manasseh and Ephraim are getting not just a blessing from their grandfather, but the blessing of God. And he takes Manasseh in his left hand, Ephraim in his right, so that it's easy for Jacob and his eyesight that's gone to just reach that right hand Joseph, I'm even making it easy on you, Dad. I'm just going to guide them to you. So all you have to do is reach your right hand out and place it on Manasseh. Then reach your left hand out and place it on Ephraim. They both would receive a blessing, but as was tradition, the one, the oldest, was blessed greater because of the outstretched right arm of the one granted the blessing. But in spite of the poor eyesight, beside of the best intentions of Joseph, the one who had the coat of many colors, the one who was the apple of his father's eye, the one who had been jerked away from his father, can you imagine how many tears Jacob had shed? Could you imagine how many tears Joseph had shed? Can you imagine the times that Jacob probably thought about, what does Joseph look like now? What what, what would have happened? Can you imagine the times and the tears and the thoughts and maybe Joseph, as those children were born, I wish my dad could see my children. I wish my dad could see. And as they begin to grow and the pride of a father in Joseph's heart began to swell. And he saw the, the young men that they were becoming. I wish, I wish my dad could see them. He'd be so proud. I wish they could see him. Now God has put them together. And Jacob isn't the trickster anymore. Jacob's an old man. His days are going to be are numbered and they're going to be very short and very soon his life is going to be over on this side of eternity. It's in that moment he is with Joseph after Joseph hears that his father is getting close to die. He brings his boys to him and Jacob, I've already referred to the scripture, 
I never even thought I'd see you. Now I see your boys. What, what a, could you imagine? What, just the spirit that was in that room, can you imagine? The, the tears that were probably wiped away as Joseph was there. And here's the moment that Joseph never thought he'd have. Here's the moment when God's blessings are going to be passed from Jacob to his sons. And he has his oldest, Manasseh. He has the youngest, he has Ephraim. I'm going to make it easy and I'm going to guide them so that all my dad has to do is just reach his hands out. But in spite of the blindness and the poor eyesight, Jacob reaches across with his right hand and places it on Ephraim. He takes his left hand and he places it on Manasseh. What an odd thing to do. And then you hear the scripture, guys, you can go sit down, thank you. You, you. you see in the scripture, Joseph got upset. Dad, you're ruining my moment. That it's, no, it's, it's Ephraim is the younger, Manasseh is the older. I, I, I know you haven't, you haven't been around them. I know you don't know them. But the right hand of blessing goes on Manasseh. And look at verse 19 of Genesis 48. It is this verse that's why is the reason we read in Hebrews chapter 11 of the faith of Jacob. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He shall also shall become a people, and he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, And thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And he, and he said, and Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Joseph gets upset. He saw, in verse 17, tells us that when he saw the right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. Can you imagine how confusing this was? He brings it, and he sees that hand reach across. Then the other hand reach across. The greater blessing went to the younger son. No, Dad, that's not how it works. And Jacob refused the wishes of his favorite son. He refused the wishes of Joseph, that mighty man. He refused his wishes even though Joseph did not understand and Joseph got upset. If, if these characters we read in pages of Scripture in this Old Testament time are flesh and blood like we are as the Bible says they are. Jacob probably had in, the heart, in his heart as a parent, like a lot of parents do, when a wrong has been done or there's been some suffering to a, to, a, to a loved one, we want to try and make up for it. We want to try and give them everything we can give them. But Jacob did not budge because God had instructed him to do that very thing. It took a lot of faith, a lot of faith for Jacob to say, I know it may not make sense, but in my final hours, I believe that God is, 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 is in this. I believe that God will make them the nation, the people that he wants to make them. The faith in his older days. Faith, it's never too late for faith. This is not the same man. This is a man who, when he was younger, tried to manipulate the will of God. He took advantage of his father. He took advantage of the situations that were presented to him. Now, in this moment, his faith has grown to a point, and he's had to learn faith. Sometimes it takes us a long time to learn the lesson of faith that God wants us to learn. 
Uh, sometimes you can't cram to pass that faith exam. Sometimes you can't work ahead and graduate early. Sometimes God not just puts you through kindergarten and grade school and junior high school and in high school and then he puts you through uh, college and then graduate school and then sometimes he says, you know, I think I want you to go through the whole thing all over again. Sometimes you can't cram it in. Sometimes it takes a long time for you to learn that faith that God wants you to learn. We find Jacob mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, this great chapter of faith for this story that we just read and illustrated. Trusting what God had instructed him at the risk of displeasing the son he loved very much. You can say it like this, the last act of Jacob was an act of faith. I know a lot of Christians who've lived a life of faith, but their last acts were not of faith. I don't know what God has for me in the future. I don't know how many days He's allotted me. I just assume the trumpet sound and we all go, but I will say this, that I want to enter the presence of my Savior as a faithful man, a man living by faith, my last days, my last hours, pleasing God as I enter into His presence. There is no greater way to meet our Savior than to be living a life that pleases Him through faith. And it's those last years, and tonight I'm going to give us the truths in just a moment, and I've taken a little bit more time to, to illustrate in, in, in the introduction because I think it's important for us to see how important this faith was because God had made a promise to Abraham. He had promised Abraham that he was going to bless him and make of him a great nation. And, of course, from the nation of Israel and from those people, was, was the, the, the Messiah was going to come, the Lord Jesus Christ, that sacrificial lamb was going to come and pay for the sins of the world. So it's so important, and God always keeps His word. He's not capable of not keeping His word, and that He was going to bless and keep those promises. And it was important that Jacob live by faith in this moment and do what God had instructed him to do because it was more than just about Jacob. Let me just give you some things tonight that we see from the life of Jacob in his latter years. And as I give you these things in just a moment, I want to remind you, make a couple of statements. It's never too late for faith. I've heard this statement my whole life. I've had the privilege of growing up in church, growing up in a preacher's home. I've heard testimony from people say, it says, well, I wish I hadn't wasted all those years. And, 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 it's a, and it's an opportunity that if you grow up in church, you grow up in the right, right, right opportunity, I hope you never have a testimony that says, I wish I hadn't wasted those years. But maybe tonight you would say, well, I wish I, I hadn't wasted those years. And, or maybe you know somebody that's wasting their years. I want to give all of us hope and encouragement tonight in the, in the form of Jacob. It's never too late for faith. It doesn't matter if you were saved at 65 years of age, you've still got time to have faith in God. It doesn't matter now you've wasted years, you've gotten things right with God, you still can please God. You still can have faith. And by the way, you and I should not give up on people. What saddens me, and I probably, I'm just going to say it anyway, the average independent Baptist would have blackballed Jacob, would have branded him, would have cast him in the outer darkness because of how he lived, the things that he did, but yet we find him in Hebrews chapter 11 as a man of faith because God saw in that heart, God did a work in his life, and it took a lifetime for God to work in his heart, in his life. And now, in his last moments, in his last hours, instead of just going with the flow, he obeyed God in a moment of faith that God said, I'm going to preserve for all of eternity, 
in Hebrews chapter number 11. Let me point out some things concerning Jacob that you and I can take from. Number one, uh, Jacob did not stop investing in others. Jacob invested in his grandsons, his own grandsons. He did not stop investing in others. I wonder how many times Christians, because somebody they invested in, it just seems like God ripped those dreams away. Or maybe they forsook what they had been taught. Uh, and we, and, we, and we, we feel sorry for ourselves. We find ourselves being like the Old Testament Samuel, this is the prophet Samuel, when Saul was rejected by God. God had to come to him and say, get a hold of yourself. Go find another. There's another man that I'll make a king. But Jacob invested... His last act was investing in his own grandsons. Often, we get to a place in our life when we think, well, there's nothing more that I can offer. There's nothing more that I can do. Or I've got some wasted years. Or there's some time that I I didn't use as prudently as I should have. Well, Jacob is in his last days, and he's still investing in somebody else. That takes faith. It takes faith to continue with the days that you have, the years that you have left. Maybe you've got uh, more days behind you than in front of you. you got more strength behind you than you have in front of you. It seems like the days are shorter and, and the years are even shorter than that. And what in the world can I offer? Jacob is not in his prime. Jacob does not have that mind that could maneuver and manipulate. Jacob does not have all of that the wealth and the blessing that he had. Jacob is an old man leaning on his staff, and in his last days, he says, bring those boys to me. I want to bless them. Would it be a God if we would have Christians who would stay faithful, or they would finish out their days investing in someone else? You know, I'm glad, and I know a lot of our senior citizens uh, aren't here tonight. Many of them are, but, but I'm assuming they're watching and haven't fallen asleep yet on their couch. But I, I, they're not here tonight. But I just want to say, I'm glad you reared your children according to the Word of God. But just because your children are reared and gone, don't stop investing in somebody else. Maybe your dreams didn't come about like you thought they would be, and, and maybe, maybe God hasn't given you children, or, or maybe, maybe your whole home situation changed and it's different than the way that you thought it would be, and say, well, there goes that opportunity for me. I'm going to go out on a limb here based on what I read about Jacob. I don't think there have been many times he'd have won Father of the Year. But yet in his old days, just let me do what I can. And invest. Continue. It's not too late for you to make a difference. I can't go. I can't go out and, and knock on doors like other people. I can't go work. Up, oh, there's other ways. You can pray. You can encourage. And if you, most of you, you don't have teenagers to feed, so you got a little bit extra cash. You. You can help buy a bus. You can help invest in a Christian school. You can help pay a kid to his, his, his expenses to camp or some other way. You can still invest. You can pray. Number two, Jacob understood that he still had an important purpose even at the end of his life. He understood he still had an important purpose even at the end of his life. I parallel this thought, and it makes me think of Samson. The mighty man Samson who wasted so much that God had given him. But he comes to the end of his life, and in his death, he brought a greater victory against the enemies of God than in his entire life. You may be here tonight listening to me, whether in the audience or watching through 
live stream tonight? You say, I wish I hadn't wasted. I wish I could go back. Well, you can't. But you need to understand something. You still have an important purpose. It's never too late for faith. And if you are in your senior years tonight, it's never too late for faith. You don't have to give up. You don't have to give in. You can keep producing for the Lord. You can continue to make an impact for God. It may not be the way that you would have done it 30 years earlier, but you still have something that you can do for the Lord. Don't give it up. He understood he still had an important purpose even at the end of his life. Jacob, at this time, was only able to stand by leaning on his staff. His health was failing. He was near death. Yet you find a very determined and purposeful man in Genesis chapter 48. Because he knew there was something he was still supposed to do for God. Whatever it is that you can still do for God, do it. Do it. Number three, don't underestimate the value of those around you who are in their senior years. I want to challenge us tonight to not underestimate the value of those around you who are in their senior years. And some, if some of you need help, whether or not you're in your senior years, I'll help you with that when, it's, when the service is over. There's one thing that is troubling in our nation is the disrespect of the generation that's come before. And I was thinking, and, and there's been a lot of predictions, you know, you, depending on which medical doctor you listen to, so I just don't listen to any of them. Um, but, you know, we have all this shut down, and maybe it flattened the curve, but how, how many people are going to die of cancer because they couldn't get their screenings? There, there, there's two sides of that. I got to thinking, I'm predicting a lot of short lives for a lot of Americans in the future. And it'll have zero to do with the pandemic. It'll have everything to do with a promise that God has put in this book. That if you honor father and mother, he'll extend your days. If you dishonor, he'll shorten your days. There's a lot of people who don't believe, a lot of Christians who act like that's not even in the Bible. Friend, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I can take you to the graveside of some who, because they dishonored. I I know preachers of of years gone by who used to preach by days or short because I dishonored my mom and dad. We have a great disrespect for those who they can't move as quick as they used to move, but and you just see them in their old years and. Little did you know, but this was the very generation that was storming the beaches on foreign soil so that we could be free. There's just a general disrespect. It's not just in our nation, it's in our churches too. And since I'm on the subject, there's a lot of, I hesitate to call them men, who even have preacher by their name of Baptist churches who disrespect their fathers who were in the ministry, who disrespect the generation of preachers who have gone on. And I take no pride in saying this, but you mark it down here, they ain't lasted long. Years are being shortened. I'm saying all that to say, you and I, knowing that that goes on in our nation, you and I ought to be very, very aware to take advantage and be aware of those who are down, further down the road than us. I want, I want, I, you know, in some of these preachers who, who disrespect these older men of God, it's, I've been asked because we have many retired preachers. My father, who's a pastor here, is retired, and we have many retired preachers who are part of our church. I tell them all, you know, if you ain't got a place to go, just come down here. Well, so why do you do, I was asked, and asked my friend, why do you do that? I said, because one day I'm going to be an old preacher. And I believe God says you reap what you sow. 
And I don't have any sons. I've got one son-in-law coming, and I'm still waiting to see how that works out. But, you know, we want to take advantage. Be mindful of those around you. And, and you young couples, and you, and, and you young generation that's coming up. You ought to step in the void of what they don't have the physical strength to do anymore. But you ought to honor the wisdom and take advantage of the stability that you have around you. I, I, use, I love when we, when we have a deacon's meeting, because everybody in there, just about everybody in there is old enough to be my grandfather. Brother Hampton, Brother Wilde, good to see you tonight. <laughs> but the wisdom... The experience, and I'll get to that in just a moment. And this, is, this ties in, and we ought to be reminded, don't underestimate the value of those around you who are in their senior years. Well, well, they can't, and this is prevalent, in, in these emerging churches, they teach this. If they can't check all these boxes, push them aside. They can't pay the bills for you. They, they can't participate in your worship team, so just push them aside. Or when you come and you get a church, and you're going to change it, you're going to transform it, and you're going to use the buildings that this generation paid for, this is how you get rid of them. Uh, boy, I, I don't want to underestimate the value of a Jacob who may not have done much that we want to emulate, but he comes to a point in his life, and that's when he had his greatest days of faith. That's when he did his greatest work for the Lord it was in his last days. I'll move off of, that, off of that. Number four, don't underestimate your value to God as long as you're living. How many of you are alive tonight? Okay, I did that just because there are a couple of you I was worried about. <laughs> don't underestimate your value to God as long as you are living. Everybody in here is alive. You have value in the work of God. You have value to God because God sent His Son to pay for your sins. That's value. But if you're alive, you have value. You may not have the same story somebody else has. You may not have the same testimony somebody else has. You may have some things... And you look back in your life and say, I wish I hadn't wasted those years. Or maybe you didn't get saved till later in life. Or maybe you've just been plodding along this whole time. If you're still alive, you have value to God. It doesn't matter if you're 5, you're 50, or 150 tonight. Whatever the case is, if you're still breathing, you have value to God. Well, I, I can't do what I, I used to be able to do. Well, you can still pray. You can still pray. You can give like you couldn't give when you were trying to rear eight kids. You can invest in the lives of somebody else. You can be an encourager. You can, you, and we, we won't know till we get to heaven, but you get, you get some of these uh, uh, young Christians and they come in and they wonder if they can make it. And these young couples start rearing their children. I wonder if, if we can really do it. And they look around and they see some with, with the gray hair and those that have been here for years and decades and decades. You don't know how much of an encouragement that is for them to say, well, if they can do it, we can do it. Don't underestimate the value your value to God as long as you are living. When, how do you know when God's done with you? When He takes you home. All of us have a purpose. That's why we're supposed to please God by faith. That's why we're supposed to pursue... God put me here with a purpose. He created a purpose. He has a purpose and He created my life. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility to get on the same page with God of why He has you here. And when He's done with you, He'll bring you home. So if He hasn't brought you home, He's not done with you. So therefore, you have value in the work of God. Number five, and last one. 
Jacob knew something that Joseph did not know. We saw this in Genesis chapter 48. Joseph was not pleased when his father placed his right hand upon the head of Ephraim and his left hand of lesser blessing upon the head of the older son Manasseh. Jacob, however, had known God longer and had insights that Joseph did not have. If, if you, we were to take a vote tonight, if we were to start over here with the houses we're going to see on the front row tonight, if we, were to, if we were to take a vote over here and go all the way around and take a vote, who do you think was the greater man, Jacob or Joseph? I know what I would say. I'd say Joseph. It would probably be unanimous if you knew who Jacob and Joseph were. But yet there was still something that Jacob knew that Joseph didn't. Don't miss this for the time I have left. God had to use Jacob's life teach him what he wanted him to know to get him to a point where his greatest faith was in his last days. Joseph had to have a lot. Joseph lived by faith. Joseph, great man. In, in my estimation, on the pages of Scripture, outside the Lord himself, probably the greatest man, in my opinion. But yet... There is something Jacob knew he didn't know. And the only way Jacob knew it, because he, he had lived more days. He had learned more lessons. And sometimes he learned the lesson by failing. Sometimes he learned the lesson by doing what he shouldn't do. But God was faithful and Jacob was faithful, and Jacob learned how to wrestle with God. If you remember that account in Scripture, he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And he held to him so much that he had to have his leg put out of joint. He wrestled with God. God saw fit to bless Jacob in all of his imperfections, in all of the things he did wrong, in all of his deceit, he wrestled with the Lord. Lord blessed him, changed his name, and now in his last days, he knew something that Joseph did not know because he had learned lessons that Joseph had not learned. There is wisdom in those who have lived longer. There are things that they know that I may not know. We get in our mind that this person can't help me, so I'm just pushing them aside, or this person doesn't know what I know, so I'm pushing them aside. And no, no, Dad, get your hands right. Get your hands right. But Jacob knew something that Joseph didn't know. You know how much it would do you if you let the people around you teach you what they knew? In, in my mind, I, I've, I've lived the dream life. God has blessed me. I know that. I know it. I acknowledge it. Don't get mad at me. I didn't pick it. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a pastor's home. Saved when I was just a couple months shy of my fifth birthday. Saved. Never doubt, known I'm saved. I was called to preach when I was six years of age. I, I, I know God. I, to me, I've lived the dream life. I've grown up in, in, since I was six years old. I've been part of this church except for when I was in Bible college. And, 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 I, and now I get the pastor of the church I grew up in. I have lived the dream life. But I'd be a fool. And by the way, I know a lot of Bible. I, I, I know I've, I've seen a lot of things in my life. I think I've got a pretty good mind. I, I, I know some things. You say, wow, you're really bragging tonight. No, don't miss this point. In spite of being blessed how I've been blessed, 
and all the gifts that God has given me, I'd be a fool to not listen to those who have learned lessons and now they have some faith that has grown out of the lesson. There's many of you that are part of this church and you may be here tonight, you may be listening and you have, you've had the opposite of what I've been privileged with. And you say, well, what could I possibly, how could I possibly be a help to a pastor? How can I possibly be a help to a blessing? You've got an insight and a viewpoint I don't have. And because you did come through, you have faith that could only have come from what you went through. That's, that's why you have it. You say, well, I don't, I don't see how I'm, I mean, I don't have that. and I, I didn't get to grow up in a church like this. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up this, or I was away from the Lord and I, I came back. So now you have a perspective of faith. Somebody who's never walked those, that path doesn't have. We have a great staff. We, it's different perspectives. There's different ages. And, you know, we have younger men on staff. They'd be, and they're small, they, they, they have their, their own wisdom, and they, they have their own talents, and they have their own abilities, but they'd be fools to disregard with the older men. Say, I sit in our deacons meeting, and I look around, and man, those gray heads have gotten gray. Even Rodney's gotten gray. I noticed that the other day. As, as we discuss some matters in there, and I let them know what I'm thinking, and I hear their viewpoint, and I want to hear their viewpoint. I welcome their viewpoint. And thankfully, we have men who understand how the Bible says a church ought to be run. They, they don't lord over me. But I expect them to give me their honest viewpoint. I can't make a decision until I know what, until I'm informed with everything. You say, why do you do that? Because they've lived the journey I haven't lived. In some cases, like three that I haven't lived. Do you get the point I'm making? But I mean, I've lived a dream life. I've grown up in a Christian home. I've grown up in a preacher's home. I've been a preacher's kid. I've been in ministry 20-something years now. I've been a pastor over seven years. I have been, if, I've been, if anybody's been bred to do this, it's me. If anybody has been set apart to do, God has blessed me. But there's faith that others have in this church that even your pastor needs. There's things that those who are older and have walked a different path, they have faith that's born out of the life that they've lived. That's why, let me say, as we get ready to close, don't give up on the prodigal. It's tragic. And let me just say, because we have a lot of young people in our church, don't waste your years. Because you will regret it. You'll regret it. I still love you. Mom and dad will still love you, but you'll regret it. But don't give up on them. Because there's nobody that's going to beat themselves up more than the prodigal who comes back at the years they wasted. You say, why do you bring that up? Because it's never too late for faith. It's never too late. God is, is such a mighty God, and God is the kind of God that there's somebody out there right now who they're dishonoring God with their life. Or there's somebody who play, is playing church tonight. You looked apart, but like Job pitched his tent towards Sodom, you've pitched your heart towards Sodom. You played the part, and, but hey, we're going to keep preaching. We're going to keep singing. 
We're going to keep holding the line. We're going to keep loving one another. Now's not the time for Pharisees to look down their nose and say, why are they wasting what God has given them? And that's a tendency for those who haven't had what the kids who grew up here have. Well, if I'd have had, the, if I'd have had all of that, I, would have, I, would, I wouldn't waste it. Be careful, because it's never too late for faith. They may get the attention of God in their last days because God teaches them over the course of a lifetime the lesson of faith. I hope this makes sense tonight. I hope it gives encouragement to us tonight. No matter where you are in life, be faithful to the end. Be faithful to the end. Let's not look at one another and say, well, I don't have what someone else have. I can't do it. I, I'm not a Joseph. I'm not this and that. Hey, be who you are. As long as you're here, God has something for you. In your experiences that you've lived, the mistakes and, and the blessings are lessons that will grow your faith, will increase your faith. Father, help us tonight to...